Rendering is usually the last step of the whole editing process, but that doesn't mean it is the least important. In fact, getting your render settings right can have a huge impact to the positive on your final export. So that's why I'm gonna share with you my personal best render settings for DaVinci Resolve going into 2023. But now before we jump into the actual render page, it is always good to check your general settings and your project settings before to make sure you really get the most out of your project. And the first one is for all the Mac users. If you're not a Mac user, you can skip this section. All the Mac users who experience a color shift after exporting, first of all, you wanna to navigate to the top left of your screen to where it says DaVinci Resolve, click that, then go down to preferences. In the system tab, you wanna go down to where it says general and make sure you use Mac display color profiles for viewers is checked on. So you get the accurate colors represented within DaVinci Resolve. Then you wanna hit save. And once that is done, we can go to the bottom right side of your screen to access the project settings right here. First of all, I'm not gonna talk about resolution and frame rate just now but I will cover that in the render page. First of all, I want you to go to color management. And right here, I set my color signs to DaVinci YRGB and I use separate color spaces and gamma. So the timeline color space that I use is Rec 709 and the gamma is Rec 709A. And if you're on a Mac, you wanna choose Rec 709A as well because that is optimized for Mac. And the output color space is Rec 709 and gamma 2.4 because most monitors are set to gamma 2.4. But then if you're going down to lookup tables and you're often using LUTs on 8-bit footage, I highly recommend to change this from trilinear, which is the default setting, to tetrahedral. Because tetrahedral will just result in less bending and less artifacts, especially when you work with 8-bit footage a lot. So then I want you to go down and set your broadcast safe IRE levels and minor set between minus 20 to 120 and the checkbox make broadcast safe is always checked. So these are my settings. And if you wanna use those settings too and you don't wanna to have to change them every single time, I recommend to go to the top right of this window, click the three dots and choose set current settings as default preset. So once you've done that, you will never have to change them again. And whenever you open up a new project, those are now your default settings. Once you've done that, you can hit save. And now it's time to go to the actual render page. So within the render page first, I want you to notice that I am on the custom export tab. Now you can always choose the YouTube preset or Vimeo preset, but the downside of using one of those presets is that you have no customizability when it comes to quality and custom bit rates. But for now, I'm gonna stick to the custom preset and everything that I'm not explicitly talking about stays default. First of all, the first two are obvious. File name is just the name that you want the final video to be and the location is where you want the final export to live in. And in order to render one single video, we have to select a single clip. This will render the whole timeline as one single video file compared to individual clips, which will render each clip on the timeline as an individual video file. So unless that's something that you're intentionally going for, keep it to single clip. So my format of choice is MP4 and the codec of choice is H.265. Because H.265 is just a newer version of H.264. It is more compressed, which means you will have less file sizes. And it actually, at least in my opinion, gives you the better image. But if you're having trouble with H.265, just stick to H.264, this is totally fine as well. So if you're on a Windows machine, you will have a third option called encode with also a drop-down menu choosing Nvidia and native. So if you have an Nvidia graphics card, you can always choose Nvidia because this will just speed up your render times. Native will just use your CPU. Please note, you will only have this option if you have the studio version of DaVinci Resolve. And if you're on a Mac just like I am, you can use, use hardware acceleration if available. Always make sure to check that on because it will speed up the rendering process a lot. And hey, if this video was helpful or valuable to you up until this part, please let me know by hitting the like button, maybe even going as far as leaving a comment. That would just make my day and big thank you to you. So now let's talk about resolution and frame rate. And first of all, and the most important thing is that your timeline frame rate should always match your output frame rate. And that means, let me just bring this up right here. If your timeline frame rate is set to 24 frames per second, it should match the exact same number in the output frame rate. If your timeline frame rate is set to 25, don't leave your output frame rate to 24. If your timeline frame rate is set to 50, don't leave your output frame rate at 24. Always make sure that those two numbers are the same. It doesn't matter which numbers you choose, but just make sure that the numbers are matching because otherwise your video will have a jittery playback. 
Now let's talk about resolution. My resolution is set to 3840 by 2160. And if you also want to render out a 4K video, just make sure that the timeline format and the timeline resolution are 3840 as well. Because if your timeline is set to 1080, but you want to output a 4K video file and choose 4K right here, it will use the 1080 image and upscale it to 4K. So if you want to have a real 4K image, just make sure that your timeline resolution is also set to 4K. If you want to output a 1080 file, just select timeline resolution 1080 and then choose the resolution 1080 in the render tab as well. So if we go down just a little bit more, we see quality and this by default is set to automatic. However, I haven't had good experiences with automatic. That's why I always recommend to restrict your bitrate. Just select restrict to and a general rule of thumb for this number right here is let's say you want to export a 1080 video. So 1920 by 1080 right here in the resolutions tab is use your frame rate and multiply it by a thousand. So in this case, it's 24,000 kilobits per second. Just type in 24,000 right here. If your timeline frame rate is set to 60, that's 60,000 kilobits per second. And if your timeline resolution is 4K, so you want to output a 4K video, just use your frame rate and multiply it by 2000. In this case, it's 48,000. If your timeline frame rate is set to 60, that's 120,000. Now, I know this might be a little bit overkill and why do you need higher bit rates for higher frame rates? A frame rate of 24 frames per second means that you have 24 individual images in one single second. If you have a frame rate of 60 frames per second, you have 60 individual images in one single second. So that means if we want to maintain the quality, we have to up our bit rate. So that's a good starting point. Now, this will give you good results, but it will also spit out huge file sizes. So keep that in mind. The rest of those settings stays default. Then if we go down a little bit more to advanced settings, you can tag your color space and gamma right here. However, what I choose here will override the color space and the output color space that I choose in my output color space right here. If you don't want to mess with this, just stick to same as project and then same as project right here. However, if we go down a little bit more until you see those checkboxes, the two I recommend are force sizing to highest quality and force debayer to highest quality. And this is especially helpful if you're working with raw footage. I never use subtitles or whatsoever and I not upload directly to YouTube. However, if you want to upload directly to YouTube, you have the YouTube settings right here. And then just make sure to check on the upload directly to YouTube, give that a title, give that a description, whatever. However, to be able to upload directly to YouTube, you have to be signed into your YouTube account with DaVinci Resolve. And in order to do that, this is pretty simple. All you have to do is navigate to the top left of your screen to you see DaVinci Resolve, then go to preferences, go to system tab, and then go down on the left side until you see internet accounts. And right here, it says YouTube and I'm currently signed in. But if you're not already signed in, just hit the sign in button and this will redirect you to a site where you can enter your email address and your password to sign into your YouTube account. And once that is done, just hit save. And now you can upload directly to YouTube within DaVinci Resolve. So and now to save you some time, that you don't have to do those steps every single time when you want to render out a new video, you can save that as a new preset. All you have to do is go to the top right of this window right here, click the three dots and select save as new preset. Now give your new preset a name. In this case, I'm going to call it new preset. So once you've done that, a new preset appears called new preset. And that is the exact same settings that we've just created. So that's all I got for today. Hope you enjoyed this video. Hope it was helpful to you. If so, please consider leaving a like and maybe even a comment. Or if you want to see more DaVinci Resolve tutorials coming up in the future, make sure to also hit the subscribe button. Otherwise, I'm going to hope you have a great day. See you next time. Bye.